In today's episode, we're going to be looking at back injuries, and we're going to be talking about and essentially answering three questions. What is it? What causes it? And how do we rehab it? And in that will include some sort of better and worst exercises based on what we're talking about, which is the back injury, what it is, and what what's causing it. The first injury that we're going to be talking about is a disc bulge slash herniation. So first of all, what is a disc bulge or a disc herniation? Well, some basic anatomy, you've got a disc. If you look down on it from a bird's eye view, you've got a gel-like fluid in the middle and then you've got these rings around the outside. So the gel-like fluid in the middle is known as the nucleus pulpus and you've got the annulus fibrosus, which is the rings that sit around the outside. So a bulge is where the, uh, the nucleus pulpus migrates its way through the annulus fibrous and it gets to the last few layers and it just bulges those last few layers out. A herniation is ever so similar, it just breaks through those final layers and the nucleus pulpus comes out of the disc. What's causing that? In a very general sense, it's spine flexion added with compression. So you are essentially, if you've got the top of the spine here and the bottom of the spine here, you're compressing it together. So you're squashing it from top to bottom and then you are bending it into flexion. Now there are some caveats that come with that and how long it will take the disc to injure but these aren't injuries that happen in one moment. So if you have suffered with a disc bulge or a disc herniation, it wasn't that one moment where you picked up the pen or where you went to lift a box from the floor. It was uh, weeks, months, possibly even years that built up to that. But there are some caveats that extend the life of the spine, if you will. And that is the shape of the disc, so the shape of the disc will determine how quickly um, it can injure or it can damage. You also have the health of the spine as a general rule. So if you have muscles that are stronger or that have more endurance or that are stabilizing the spine better, obviously that will take longer for it to injure. And if you have a more deconditioned spine, i.e. the muscles around it aren't as strong don't have as much endurance and aren't stabilizing the spine as well, that kind of spine will injure more quickly. If you add in a certain disc shape on top of that, then again, that will um, injure it uh, more quickly. The other thing that goes with that will depend on the behavior of that spine or the person that has that spine and loads that they are um, using, if you will. So heavier loads, will increase the speed, but lighter loads will sort of not happen as quickly. So the, the, the injury won't happen as quickly. What we then have is you putting those together. So if you've got a spine or a disc that doesn't herniate um, or isn't predisposed to herniate because of the shape, if that spine is then strong, has good endurance, or if that those muscles around it ha are strong, have good endurance and um, uh, stabilize the spine, that will that can manage heavier loads. So the heavier loads won't um, injure as quickly as if you are lifting heavy loads with a disc shape that is more prone to herniate and muscles that aren't as conditioned to stabilizing the spine, don't have as much endurance and aren't as strong. So you can see it is a melting pot and there are ingredients that predispose it in a certain way and predispose it in, a, in another way. So that's essentially how it occurs. Spine compression and flexion. And then you repeat that cycle and it basically just wears down um, uh, the tissues, the bone, the disc, the muscles, it wears that down and then we get uh, the disc herniation and the disc bulge. Um, hopefully that makes sense because it is a bit of a, um, there are different instances when it will happen and it won't happen or it take longer or it'll be shorter. That's kind of the point that I'm trying to get across. So there is no um, 
definite to say that your spine is going to injure after doing six sit-ups or a workout of six sit-ups if you have a certain type of spine. That's what I'm trying to get across because there are a lot of people out there that say that certain exercises or movements or postures or positions are absolutely fine and we should be doing them. Yes, we should, but again, it depends on the spine that is doing them and the way that it's doing them and how it's doing them and how often it's doing them. So that kind of ends what's causing it because there is a behavioral element to it. How do we then go about rehabbing it? So how do we, or what exercises do we use? Um, and how do we go about making our spine more resilient or robust against disc injuries? Well, first of all, we have to understand the mechanism that caused it. And that is compression and flexion. So we need to think about when we are compressing it and when we are flexing it individually and when we are doing them together as well. Now, you're never really going to go throughout life and never do that. So we have to minimise it as much as, as we can. So we have to think about sitting, because that's when we flex our spine, that's at the desk chair, that's in the car seat, that's on the sofa. It could be exercises, so we have to think about exercise technique, the position of the spine, the load that we're using. So these are all the postures, the positions, the movements and the loads that we need to be thinking about when we're doing that. So first of all, we need to understand that mechanism that caused it. We need to then start reducing that mechanism. That's then going to start desensitizing the pain. It's going to start allowing the muscles to heal, or sorry, the tissues to heal. And it's going to then allow all the muscles to recover as well. And then we can then start rebuilding the spine. So we need to basically rebuild three things. So the three things that I talked about. The strength, the endurance, and the stability. They're the three things that we need to rebuild. Now, if we're talking about a mechanism which involves compression and flexion, it's probably a good idea not to use exercises that use compression and flexion. What I should also say is rotation is another, another cause of it because that, that uh, fatigues or delaminates the disc and allows it to migrate as well. So there's a rotational aspect to it. So we need to start thinking about, certainly in the early stages, of how we select our exercises. So we need to start selecting exercises that maintain the posture of the lumbar spine. Now, throughout everyday life, you are going to move your spine, that's going to happen. But again, as I mentioned, we need to minimize it. We need to build that core endurance, we need to build the core strength, and we need to build the core stability. So we would probably use exercises like planks, side planks, bridges, and bird dogs. The ones that I always use as my first port of call. Again, I need to go through a full assessment of the individual to be able to choose those specifically, but as a general rule, those will be the first exercises. They are the safest ones that I've found, that I've used with people, as long as the load is done correctly, the duration of the exercise is done correctly. There are those caveats that come with it, but essentially, it's a plank, it's a side plank, it's a bird dog, and it's a bridge. So we choose those exercises, and we start building endurance into it, which is the length at which, or the duration at which, we can perform those exercises. The strength is being the ability to get into the position that we want to be in. Then we add the endurance in, which is then hold that position for a long period of time. And then we would go about uh, building the stability of it, which is the muscle timing. So if you can imagine walking, for example, when you lift, when you're lifting up your legs, your muscles are going contract, relax, and contract on the other side. So they're constantly contracting on one side and relaxing on the other side as we walk. Now, if that is slightly mistimed by a split of a second, then there's going to be an instability within that and that's gonna help um, create pain. So we need to be able to stabilize. So using an exercise like a half kneeling as an example. So just going down onto one knee and focusing on balance because your knee is gonna wobble, your torso is gonna wobble, your hips are gonna wobble, when, so we would have a wide stance, we go down onto one knee, we then 
have a relatively wide stance. So the back knee is over here and the front foot is over here. And then over time, we've come onto more of a tight rope. That's obviously gonna challenge the balance that much more. And then that's going to um, keep us in a much better uh, or stable posture, which is gonna get the muscles to time more effectively. So as a summary, to finish this little section, what is a disc bulge or herniation? It's where the nucleus pulbus either bulges the annulus fibrosus last few layers or herniates through it. What's causing it? Spine compression and flexion, and there is an element of rotation of the spine as well. How do we then go about rehabilitating it? First of all, we need to know the mechanism. Then we need to rebuild endurance, strength, and stability to go with that. Injury number two is a foramen stenosis. Now, a foramen stenosis, there are two types of stenosis. There is the stenosis of the canal, where the spine, uh, sorry, the, uh, the spinal cord um, goes down through, that narrows and irritates. Um, but you've also got the foramen. So that's essentially where the nerves come off the spinal cord and then come out of the spine. They come out of these little holes and essentially those holes become narrowed. What then happens is that irritates the nerve and you can get um, pain when the nerve is irritated. What's causing that? A lot of uncontrolled spine motion and then what that does, that causes the arthritic changes so the bone to be added um, or the, the canal to be uh, narrowed of the foramen or the neural where the, where the nerve comes out of the, of the spine. That then goes on to, as I've mentioned, that then irritates the spine. How do we then go about rehabilitating that? Well, if the cause is uncontrolled spine motion, so there's just lots of it, that's one of the things we then need to start managing. And with regards to how we can go about opening that gap, this is where traction can be useful. Now, traction is um, where you've got the two discs, uh, sorry, the two vertebra, and then you essentially try and create more space and open that gap. Now, with regards to um, sort of true stenosis, which is what we're talking about, this is the, the, the narrowing of the canal. Now, I should mention, if you have a disc that loses height, that can also cause that change, but that's not a stenosis, that's a disc degenerating. So it's a slightly different um, uh, cause, but you can kind of get the same effect from it, if, if that makes sense. So what we're talking about is the stenosis, which is where um, material is laid down to, to narrow that gap. You've still got the necessary disc height. So how we go about rehabilitating that is one, traction can be useful. Now that's not to say that traction is the answer. It can be helpful method to use. But again, that needs to be tested and assessed to see if that can be used. So we would go about um, potentially adding traction into a, a rehab program. What you've also got are extension postures. And the reason for the extension is that can start taking load away from the spine. So along with the traction, as you open the gap, with the extension, you start to calm. Now, I'm not talking about full extension. What I'm talking about is just extending the spine so the muscles relax and it takes the compression and the load away from the spine because of the muscle activation. What we've then got are walking intervals if you will. Now, these are generally short because what the individual may experience are longer walking periods or longer standing periods can irritate and create or cause pain, if you will. So what we do is we basically just minimize that um, that in, that or that that walk into intervals, into shorter intervals. Now again, how long the interval is, it would be of of a shorter nature. But unless until that's tested, we won't we won't know what that is. But that's easily tested. You just need to ask the question: 
when does my pain begin as I walk? And then you can start to break that up into intervals. What we can also do with those um, intervals is not only make them shorter, but we can walk a little bit faster. What does walking faster do? Is again, it starts to unload the spine and gets more muscles working, but it also gets the, the muscles working, as I described, like elastic bands. So you aren't necessarily using your muscles to walk, like you lift a weight. What you're doing is you're turning your muscles into elastic bands and you're kind of springing, you have a spring in your step, if you will, and you're starting to bounce along. And that's how um, these, the, that's what walking faster is doing. What that then does, that again, that takes load away from the spine and adds it around the tissues because more of the tissues are working and they're working like springs. So they use that load to help propel you forwards. So it's not just a case of you're ambling along. There is a faster nature to the walk. What also then starts to happen is the arm swing starts to come in, which then just adds to that springy nature and bouncing nature uh, to, the, to, the, to the spine or to the walk um, and unloads the tissues. Because what's generally found is that slower walking of longer duration and postures that use flexion or even exercises that use flexion, they load the spine. And that's something that we want to try and take away because that's only going to add compression to the spine, which is going to um, create the create the environment for improper technique or excess load or unnecessary load on the spine. So those are kind of three things that we need to sort of move away from. Longer walking periods, slower walking and flexion postures. When it comes to exercises, again, we don't want exercises to add lots of load to the spine. So we would use that shorter interval um, idea as a way of using or using that within the sets for the exercise. So we don't want to necessarily be doing long duration side planks as an example. We might just split it up into three to send 10 second blocks. So we're not compressing the spine and then holding that compression there. We're compressing, getting the muscles active, and then we're releasing, getting the muscles active, and then we're releasing. That's then starting to add a nature of stability to those muscles, and that's what we can then uh, start developing. So it would be using an exercise like the side plank in short intervals, bridge to get the glutes working because the glutes are effective in work uh, when we walk. So we need to get those more active, again, to start taking that load away. We would also um, use something like the bird dog because the arms and the leg being lifted will switch the muscles on and then when we bring them down and change them over, that will alternate, so it will not only create a degree of stability, it will also use that short interval nature to the way that we want our muscles to work. So again, as a quick summary, uh, what is stenosis? Certainly of the what we're talking about, the foramen, which is where the narrowing of that canal, where the, the nerve comes out of the spine. How, um, uh, what's causing that um, uncontrolled spine motion? So we need to when we talk about rehabilitating it, first of all, we need to control that motion. So we need to think about the postures, positions, and the movements that we're in or that we're using, and we need to start controlling them with muscle contraction. With regards to postures, we need to uh, we can use traction. Sorry, extension can help that because it unloads the spine, and walking is another way of being able to unload the spine, doing it in short duration, um, doing it of a faster nature and um, getting the arms swinging. When we're talking about exercises, we're gonna use that short interval nature to our exercises. So we would use side plank, we would use bird dog, we would use bridge to not only stabilize the spine, but access the muscles that help with walking as well. So that is again, a, just a general summary overview of some of the things to start thinking about with regards to uh, foramen stenosis. 
Injury number three is spondylolisthesis. What is this? It's a big, long, complicated name, but from a very simple perspective, you have vertebra, disc in the middle, vertebra on top, and then you have a disc vertebra on top of that. Now, at the back of the vertebra, there is a little arch, and then it goes into the spinous processes, transverse processes at the back. Now, what essentially happens is the body of the vertebra becomes disconnected, so the front becomes disconnected from the back. So the bone basically breaks and the vertebra slips forward. So that's essentially what spondylolisthesis is, is the slipping of the vertebra. Now, it's not the breaking, that's different. It's the slipping, or it's the break with the slippage, essentially. What's causing it? So what's causing that break to happen and then the slip to happen? Well, what's causing the break to happen are excessive extension postures and sort of the repetitive nature of the extension postures. And the other one is excessive anterior shear forces. So the extension postures, so at the most extreme level, if you can think of a gymnast, when they do that back bend, where they've got their feet on the floor, and then they arch their back all the way over, and then they have their hands on the floor. That is the most extreme nature of an extension posture. Now, obviously, that type of extension repeated with decondition around the spine to the muscles and so on and so forth, that is when the spine is at biggest risk of that happening. If you have an extended posture, but it's being done for weeks, months, years, then you get a very, very gradual weakening of that tissue. And then eventually it will break. And that's, so you get lots of little micro traumas and then it hits a tipping point and then it just snaps. And then that's when you get the break. The other one is anterior shear forces. Now anterior shear forces, so imagine this is the front of the vertebra. That is where the vertebra is being pulled forwards. Now that can come from excessive flexion to the spine because that shuts off the muscles at the back which create a posterior shear force. So when you maintain the neutral posture of the spine, those muscles are essentially pulling the vertebra back. When you flex, the, you get the anterior shear force but without the posterior shear force to neutralize it. So what we need to be able to do is when we're talking about rehabilitating it, is we need to essentially remove or minimize those postures. So that's the first thing, is understand the nature of the, the mechanism that injured it, and we can then, that can start to inform at the beginning stages of the movements, the postures, positions, and loads that we need to start using. So we will probably need to start using a more neutral posture so we will start to increase that and we will start to minimize excessive extension and flexion postures. We would then start developing the tissues around the spine. So it would be, as I mentioned, minimize flexion, minimize uh, excessive extension, and then start building in core endurance at that neutral posture because what we're what we're essentially saying is this has happened, so what do we do now? So we've got the slippage, what do we do now? So we need to start stabilizing that area. So what we need is the muscles to, to contract at the right time around it to be able to hold, because you've got the vertebra, the disc, the vertebra, then the disc and then another vertebra, but let's just say this one in the middle is unstable because it's not being held in place. And if it's of the lumbar spine, there are no bony structures to hold it in, in place. It is just the muscles. So we need QL muscle. We need abdominal muscles, so the abdominal wall. We need longissimus iliocostalis to hold that area stable. The QL will be an important part to it because not only when we get the contraction of it, we get a small degree 
of compression as well, which will hold the vertebra in place. If you get too much compression, again, it can push it further forward. But if we can get the right amount, so again, it's not to be excessive with these um, muscle contractions as well. So stability is going to be a big part of that. And stability is the ability of the muscles to contract at the right time. So stabilizing the pelvis, stabilizing the spine are going to be big parts of this rehabilitation. And by stabilizing the spine, it's about getting the muscles to time at the right time. So when you lift up a weight, you're contracting as you're about to lift or you're pre-contracting as you lift. With more refined movements, so like walking, you've got contract and it's sort of going through that contract, relax cycle as your feet and legs are moving. So we need that to happen at the right time. So some degree of balance training will be helpful for that because that will tell all the muscles from the ankle, the knee, the hip, the spine to communicate and stabilize that whole system of joints. So we need to be able to not only build stability to the core, but stability down through the legs as well. Also, we need that to last a long time. So we need to build endurance into all of the muscles. So using exercises like planks, side planks, bridges, but using them in a way where we're not overly compressing. So it doesn't want to be high strength because high strength is high compression. Endurance is sort of a moderate compression, but just done over a longer period of time. But we can also build intervals into that like we've talked about before. We, need to, we can build intervals into that to break a side plank up into three 10 second blocks with a short break in between of say five or 10 seconds. That will start to build endurance in. That will also start to build a degree of, comp uh, of stability in by, minimi uh, by sort of releasing the compression and bringing it back on, releasing the compression and bringing it back on. So there are all these different um, elements that would come into it. Also with being able to minimize the movement of the spine, we would bring in hip, increasing hip range of movement. So stretching the hips, mobilizing the hips, using exercises to increase the range of movement like squats, like Romanian deadlifts, to be able to enhance the movement at the hip, even as uh, like a wide side lunge as well, that will go part in part to um, improving the range of movement of the hip. So it allows us to move from the hip so our spine doesn't move. Because if we need to lift with poor range of movement of the hip, we're probably going to flex our spine to get there. And that's only going to, or that's going to increase the risk of causing that problem further. So we need to start building the range of movement of the hip as well and start building that into our uh, rehabilitation program. So as a quick summary, what is spondylolithesis? It's the slippage of the vertebra because of the break, or the break has happened and it's then slipped. And what's causing the break and the slippage? Excessive extension at the extreme end, it's that gymnastics, uh, the, that gymnast that I talked about, but smaller movements over a prolonged period of time, weeks, months and years, can create that problem. We've also got anterior shear forces, which is the pulling forward of a vertebra. So that can happen um, with spine flexion for the simple reason that the, the low back muscles aren't activating or aren't activating effectively enough to create the posterior shear force to neutralize the anterior shear force. And that mechanism, again, over a period of time, is causing the problem. How do we then go about rehabilitating it? Well, one, understanding that excessive extension and um, repetitive flexion is causing the problem. So we then minimize those. We try and maximize the maintenance of the neutral spine. We then go about stabilizing the spine using an abdominal brace, using exercises to activate the muscles at the right time. Include some balance training in that to get the ankle, the knee and the hip working together and well. Then building endurance into that using planks and side planks and bridges and bird dogs as well. Then we would think about building range of movement at the hip so our 
so we are able to get greater range of movement from it so we don't have to compensate and use our lumbar spine quite as much. So that is a quick summary of the spondylolisthesis, what's causing it um, or what it is, what's causing it and how we might start to think about rehabilitating it. Many thanks for watching this episode. If you found it useful, if you've got um, one of these conditions and you've maybe not been quite sure about what you need to start doing, again, use these ideas as a general rule to start thinking about to apply to your lifestyle so you can then start going about uh, rehabilitating your, uh, your back injury. And that goes for disc bulge, stenosis and um, spondylolisthesis. So many thanks for watching. Uh, if you've liked the content, please do hit the like button below. If you've got a comment or a question, please do leave it down below. If you've uh, learned something new, hit the thanks button. And uh, if you want to watch more tutorials and podcast episodes like this, please do hit the subscribe button and the bell icon below.